Welcome everyone to Zoom into Books this afternoon. We have Joan Costner, Reader's Favorite International Book Award winner, and she has recently published the award-winning Forgotten Women series featuring that Dickinson girl, the story of orator Anna Dickinson, Censored Angel, the story of Ida C. Craddock, marriage counselor, and the soon-to-be-released Priscilla, or per, I'm sorry, Prairie Cinderella, based on the life of American sculpt, sculptress Benny Reen. Joan, welcome to Zoom into Books. We're very happy to have you today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's our honor to have you. I'd like for you to start out today, please, by telling the viewers a little bit about yourself and how you got started. And I do want to welcome everyone who is watching live on Facebook this afternoon. If you have questions for the author, for Joan, during her interview, um, just type them in the Facebook comments and I'll make sure that she has a chance to answer your questions before we end the interview. So Joan, Tell us all about you and what you're doing. Okay, well, I am currently write, a writer, an author of fiction books, but for most of my life, I wrote nonfiction. I wrote academic and textbooks. And when I retired, I decided I'd like to write something a bit more fun. And so I turned to fiction. And so for, this, for quite a number of years now, I've been writing fiction books, although I do have a write for success a series of writing craft books, which are nonfiction. So you're into several different topics. So I know yeah. that you've <laughs> got the Forgotten Women series yeah. and um, a fictional series too, plus you teach writing too. So um, you can just have the floor and I will let you know if we have any questions come in. Okay. Um, uh, the two books that I have out, uh, That Dickinson Girl and Censored Angel, are both biographical historical fiction. And so I, not everybody knows what that is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what it is and why I decided to write it. Biographical historical fiction is about real people. So both of my books feature actual people who lived and did something I thought was special or incredible that I thought was worthy of being fictionalized because it's a lot more fun to read a fiction novel than it is to read um, often biographies. Um, in a fictional novel, you can add drama for one thing. And the other thing is you can add inner thought and dialogue, which helps you feel the emotions of the person that they, they were going through during these historical events that they participated in. And it brings them alive and you feel their, uh, you know, the decision-making that they had to make. Um, it also puts historical events in a context that makes them more real. You can actually feel the struggle of a person who has to make these historical decisions. Um, and it forces you to, to be that person. I always think of it as like walking in somebody else's shoes. When you read a fiction novel, you become those characters and you live their lives through what's happening. Now, to make that possible, I think you have to select the right person. And I, I, I have been, I have a blog that I've had for years and years called Women, Words, and Wisdom, in which I've researched many different women and found things that they had said or you know, you know, firsthand things that they had written or said. And I focused on that. And I had hundreds of women that I had investigated. So when I was looking for women to write my biographical historicals about, I wanted to have women who had written a lot themselves so that I had their own words. Um, Anna Dickinson, I had a, a treasure trove of materials. 
Um, she died in 1932, and a judge had the sense to gather up all her papers and send them to the Library of Congress. So there is an Anna Dickinson collection in the Library of Congress, and it's full of letters from everybody, from Susan B. Anthony um, to um, well, all uh, Garrison, all the major names of the abolitionists of that period and fighters for women's rights, Lucretia Mott, and those people, you know, I've actually held those people's letters because you can go to the Library of Congress and they will actually bring you those materials. Anna Dickinson also kept uh, many, many albums in which she recorded her um, events. Her, uh, she had all the newspaper clippings of the things she did in her life. So there was a, a tremendous amount of materials to work with. Um, the other thing is I looked for, for people who had not been written up yet in a novel, because there, there are more and more biographical historical fiction novels coming out. Um, there's uh, one that just came out about Van Gogh called The Secret Life of Sunflowers. There's one about the second Mrs. Astor. Um, and these have become quite popular. So um, I felt that the, these... This, uh, these women would be very important. The second woman I did, Ida Craddock, she actually was a typist. She worked as a secretary. So she typed up her journals and her journals are all in Southern Illinois uh, University Library. But they were so much easier to read because they were typed as opposed to Anna Dickinson's, which are all handwritten which, by the way, is a good reason for everybody to learn how to read cursive, because if you ever want to do historical research, you're going to find a lot of handwritten materials to work with. Um, so that was why I selected Anna Dickinson. Anna Dickinson I selected also because she did something really special. She was the first woman to give an address to Congress. And it was a political address. And Abraham Lincoln was there, and his uh, Mary Todd was there, and all of the senators and, and representatives attended. And she charged them to attend. So they, so they had to attend in, in Congress. They had to come and they had to pay. And she donated the money to the Freedmen Society. She was um, an active abolitionist, and one of the things she was very uh, forceful about was that uh, black men should be able to serve in the Union Army. And so when she gave her speeches, this was something that she emphasized. Um, a little bit about her and, and some other interesting things was she came into the news when she was 16 years old. She There's a news article in the Philadelphia Inquirer describing how she she was at a debate on women's rights. Uh, she got up on the stage and there was a man who was talking about how, you know, his daughters couldn't be doctors, they couldn't be lawyers and all these things. And she got up and actually was so forceful, she drove him from the auditorium. Now, I actually wrote that scene for my book, but everybody who read it couldn't believe this actually happened which I found very interesting. Um, I, on my website, if you sign up for my, my newsletter, you'll actually get a copy of that chapter that, that was, I didn't get into the final book. Um, so she was very young. And in some ways, the book is a coming of age story because it starts when she's uh, 16, 17 and takes her all the way up to her talk to Congress. And during that time, she, she, she started out by giving lectures or, or yeah, lectures all over uh, New York, uh, Pennsylvania, and New England. Now, she was only five feet tall. Unlike most women of the time, she had her hair short and curly. If you know Civil War women, that was not, how, that was not the style of the time, but it made her even look younger. People always described her hair bouncing around when she spoke. 
And she had such a voice that she could talk to a crowd of thousand people and be heard. In fact, Mark Twain said she was the best speaker he had ever heard. Um, so in the book, book, I have her traveling around and I know that she had a companion. It's mentioned in her letters, but she never really talked about her companion. That was one thing I couldn't find. So I did provide her with a fictional companion and I decided to make this companion uh, an antithesis of Anna. Anna was very bold, very courageous. Um, you know, she was able to get up on a stage and talk to thousands of people. She was also um, able to deal with hecklers because um, not everybody in the North was for the Civil War. And she, they, the, the anti-Civil War people were called Copperheads. And they did all kinds of things. For example, they would shout fire outside her uh, speeches when she was talking. And people would, um, you know, start to, you know, panic. And she would be able to calm them down just by talking to them. Um, they turned off the gas lights on her. Um, the, the, um, they put uh, smoke, you know, spread smoke into the rooms where she was speaking. She was able to prevent panic. So that tells you that she was a pretty amazing speaker. She was also the first woman to get her entire speeches printed in the newspapers. So that helped to spread her fame because even if you couldn't go see her, you got, you got to hear her words. And she was, you know, she used a lot of uh, Greek classical references. Um, you know, today we would consider it very ornate language, but that was what, how people spoke at the time. Uh, she did so well that she was hired by the Republican Party. She was the first woman hired by the Republican Party to campaign in the midterm elections. And they sent her to all the places the men were afraid to go. So she was in these uh, towns where, where it was mostly copperheads who were very against her. And in one point, they actually cut her, they, they captured her and cut her hair. Um, so you, you can see how very brave she was. Now, the, the story uh, I, uh, it has a, another character who is a reporter. And I kind of combined all of the different reporters that followed her around into this one character. So he's fictionalized, but most of, most of what he does and says is actually taken from the newspapers and the reports. Now, I ended the book when she uh, dresses Congress, but I just if people are interested in the book, you can read that part. And then there's a whole, uh, she lived uh, to be 90, 90, she lived to 1932. So she, she lived a long time. And so she had a, a, a whole career that followed after the Civil War. Now, after the Civil War, she could no longer uh, get as many speaking engagements. So she started on the lecture circuit, Red, Red Lee's Red lecture circuit. And she went around the whole country speaking. And when she was in California, she was one of the first to stand up for the Chinese immigrants. They, they had um, Chinese immigrants on a boat and they wouldn't let them off the boat. And she uh, campaigned and said she wouldn't speak in the, in the town unless they let these immigrants off the boat. And they did. And, and uh, she was then honored by the uh, people in Chinatown. So um, she was willing to stand up and fight for causes that may or not have been totally popular at the time. Um, so in writing the book, because I had so much material in her own words, what, what I've done is in many cases, the actual dialogue is in her own words. And that was kind of fun to be able to, to put that into the book. Um, now, one of the criticisms that the book has gotten, okay, one of the, some of the criticisms the book has gotten is that she's not very likable. And I think that was my whole point 
you have this very young girl at 16 who's suddenly thrust into fame and fortune. She made, she, they were paying 50 cents a piece to come see her. So if there's a thousand people, you can figure she's making good money. And it went to her head. There's no question about it. She was arrogant and she expected to be treated well. Um, there's a story of her. She was in Albany, New York, and she had a, a talk down in Brooklyn, New York, and she had to get there. And it was very cold and the Hudson River froze. Okay. And she was on one side of the Hudson River and she realized if she got on the other side, she could take the train down to Brooklyn and she might get there in time. So she hired a, a cart and had the cart take her across the ice to the other side and somebody else decided to do the same thing when they saw her doing it well she got to the other side but the people who came after her went through the ice so that that was the risk she had taken she did get on the train she did get down to her speech in brooklyn and she arrived just in time and so she got up on the lectern and she gave her speech and the next day in the paper they said anna dickinson uh, she was a mess. Her hair was a mess, and she had mud on her shoes. <laughs> and, she, and she was so angry that that's what they saw. You know, not realizing that she she had just uh, raced forever to get there on time. Um, you know, so she she wanted to be treated well, and, and also in her later years, she uh, she well when the lecture circuit no longer was paying she decided to become an actress because that was the only other occupation in which women were paid equal to men. The problem was she was a Quaker and her friends were outraged, a Quaker actress. And of course she couldn't get hired as an actress. So she said, I'll write my own plays. So you can see, this is a, this is a woman who really had uh, you know, ambition and followed through on it. So she wrote a play and she presented it in um, New Haven, Connecticut. Um, Mark Twain was there, um, Harry Beecher Stowe. All these people came to see this play. It was about um, King, Henry's, King Henry and his wives and, and Anne Boleyn. She thought that Anne Boleyn had gotten a bad rap. <laughs> so she rewrote the story and she had this play and she did put it on um, and it was received very well in New Haven. However, when she took it to New York, the um, critics there said that she wasn't professional, that she was too, she wasn't melodramatic enough because at that time, actresses were supposed to be melodramatic, but she acted natural. She thought that you should act the way the character was. Um, so they, they, they uh, didn't like her play. But she continued. She did several other plays. She wrote a play called The American Girl, which was pretty much her story. It was about a girl who was not an actress, but who became one and you know, was successful. Um, at the end, she decided to play Hamlet. She toured the, the country playing Hamlet, and then she played Hamlet on Broadway. And again, the New York critics panned her acting style as not being melodramatic enough and she actually called them all in to the theater and scolded them and told them they didn't know what they were looking at and there's a wonderful cartoon in the new york times of anna dickinson as a school marm with her pointer you know scolding all the critics it's quite quite funny um so uh, that didn't help her though in terms of getting better better uh responses. And so even though she had earned all this money over her lifetime, she had invested in Chicago properties and they were all destroyed in the Chicago fire. So she had lost the millions of dollars that she had earned and she had been supporting her entire family. So when she could no longer earn the money, she, you know, that she had been bringing in, she had to go home and she had to go home. And her sister was very jealous of Anna because her sister was a writer and she actually had works published in 
um, the Atlantic and and so on. But she didn't have the fame that Anna had, and they just didn't get along. And so at, this was in the 1880s, and her sister decided to have her committed to an insane asylum. So you, back then, you only needed two doctors to declare somebody insane. And that's what her sister did. She brought in two doctors, and they did. They said she was insane, and they took her off to uh, the insane asylum, uh, Pennsylvania Insane Asylum in in Danville. And she insisted, of course, she wasn't insane. So she um, got there, and she wasn't allowed to write letters. Nobody knew what happened to her. It was like she disappeared. But they decided to move her to another uh, facility. And when she met the doctor who was coming to pick her up, they got in the carriage. And by the time they arrived at the other facility, he, he knew she wasn't insane. So he, she moved in with him and his wife. And she decided to sue her sister and to sue all the newspapers that had published that she was insane. And she won. She defended herself. And she won her case. But of course, it didn't work so well for her because the newspapers in retaliation decided they would not cover her anymore. And that was, there was no TV, there was no radio. The newspapers was the only way people got news and she disappeared completely. So and in some ways that was a sad ending to what was a really brilliant career for a very special woman. So I've told you the second half of the story. If you want to hear the first half, you have to get the book. <laughs> okay. So well, that was... <clears throat> well, Joan, that's got to be the most amazing story I have ever heard. Um, that takes a lot of nerve and a lot of perseverance to do that. Um, we do have one question before you move on. Um, they want to know if it's harder to write fiction about real people than to make up characters for a novel. Well, I've done both, so I have a good comparison. Um, in fact, this book has a fictional and, a, and the real person. As I said, if you have a, a, a real person and you have a lot of materials on that person, it's pretty much the same as when you make up a person because you collect and you invent the same kinds of information for that person. So for example, I know Anna Dickinson's education background. Well, if I made up a fictional character, I would also make up a, a educational background for that person. Um, I know the events from Anna Dickinson's life, um, you know, when she was a child, for example, because she wrote about that. And when I when I write a fictional character, I also invent a, a, a backstory, as we call it, what, what happened as a child, their relationship with their sisters and brothers and, and families. So in some ways it's, it's similar, except that I have to research the biographical character and I have to collect that research and organize that research. And then for the fictional one, I make it up. But you can't totally make it up because you're also are constrained by what you pick as your setting and what's going to, um, what other characters you're going to have around that person. So it's different, but in some ways the process is the same. In fact, I teach a course called Story Bibles in which I teach how to collect all that information on your characters and organize it. So you can use it. Research is something I really, really love doing, obviously. <laughs> To me, it's like a mystery, and you're and you're searching for all those clues. That's good advice, and research is one of the most important things an author can do to make their story actually seem real. So, yeah. I, I was going to say, I do just as much research for my romantic suspenses that I write. I'm I, sure. Yeah, I do just as much. I'm sure. Well. I'll let you continue on and tell us about the next thing here. Okay, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the other book. Um, this is a book about Ida Craddock. Can you see it? Is it working? 
Okay. Idocratic um, is somebody that has was totally lost in history um, for many reasons. I found, I discovered her through a biography that had been written by her. And I always read all the biographies. Um, Anna Dickinson has two biographies about her. Um, Idocratic only has one. And the thing about Idocratic is I think she was misunderstood in her own time. And I think she's still misunderstood today, um, looking at her work and so on. And that's because she was she lived at a time when spiritualism was sweeping the country. And she, of course, was part of that. Um, I opened the book with her doing a Ouija board, although at the time it, it was the pre-Ouija board. <laughs> which before Ouija, Ouija was a brand name before they became popular. But um, her mother uh, was introducing her to spiritualism early on. So she always had that part of her. Um, but she also was very, she was very determined also to be a successful woman. And so she was the first woman to apply to a Phil, uh, University of Pennsylvania undergraduate school. And it was a very sad story because the, the part, she had to take tests. She knew Greek and Latin and French and German. Um, she, she took the test. She, she scored extraordinarily high on the entrance exams. And the department admitted her and said that she could start in the next semester. And then the board uh, said, no way. You know, we, you know, and there was one man in particular who just didn't want a woman attending. And so she was told she could not attend because they didn't have adequate facilities for women. And in some ways, you know, it was, it was the major disappointment in her life. But she wanted to, she was obviously very brilliant and very, very into research and scholar, kind of like me. She wanted to do research. That was her thing. Um, but she couldn't, you know, she couldn't get in there. And so she had to find some other way to earn a living. So she taught herself stenography. And she got a job teaching stenography. She went on to write textbooks, stenography textbooks. And that was how she earned her living, and she was a sec and she did secretarial work. Um, I'm not going to tell her whole story because I think it's something to read about. But basically, as she looked for ways to earn a living, she she decided to become a marriage counselor, but she wasn't married. So she was she was a little bit clever about that, and she just told people she was married to an angel. So, so that that really intrigued me, and I thought that's a wonderful novel because right there you have, well, you know, was this a real angel? Was this a made-up angel? Was this something for publicity? And this was something I had to deal with as I wrote the novel. And that's another thing about writing about real people. You have to dramatize their life. It has to be a novel. It has to have high points, it has to have a climax, it has to have a, a dark uh, moment where the, 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 the person feels all is lost. And you're supposed to have a happy ending. And that's sometimes hard to do when a real per in a real person's life, because not every real person has a happy ending in the way we think about it. But um, I think I've, I've given each of these characters an ending that's satisfactory. I'm going to say satisfactory, um, but it's not one. It's not a romance. Like my romantic suspenses have real happy endings. <laughs> so it's not that I can't write a happy ending. It's just that real people don't always get a happy ending. Okay. So um, I I did post those links um, on the Facebook comments. Um, she is also a very amazing character who. I am not familiar with. You're bringing to light some excellent history. 
particularly about women. Um, yes, so, I, I was going to say one of my reviewers said that it was a book that every every woman should write because it's about book banning. Mm -hmm. Her marriage pamphlets were considered um, obscene and they were banned. And that was her fight her, for her freedom of speech. And it's it has a lot of implications for today. Um, yes. Because she, she was fighting against Anthony Comstock, um, who was renowned for banning things. That's right. Um, so I can, I would encourage people to read that book too. Um, so now I believe you have a writing series you want to talk about. Okay. Um, yes. Um, I've been teaching, I was a teacher most of my life. Um, I taught at all, all, all levels and all so lots of different subjects, but I taught college and uh, I, I've been teaching a lot of online courses. I teach a lot of online courses and these books grew out of the courses that I taught. So the first book is about writing fast. I have to say that the very first book I wrote took seven years, my first fiction book. But of course, I was going from nonfiction to fiction. Um, it took me seven years. Uh, the next book I wrote, I wrote in, I did um, the November uh, writing month, and I wrote it in 30 days. <laughs> so I learned how to write a lot faster. And so I shared some of my tricks uh, of how to do that. And it's a really short book. And it's basically just a whole bunch of ideas that you can try if you want to write much faster. And it doesn't just apply to novels. It applies to anything you want to write. So can my you, writing books are not just for fiction writers. They're for all writers. Can you give the viewers one really good tip to help with that? Well, uh, this is one not everybody likes. But if you have an outline, it'll make it go a lot faster. And you know where you're going. It's kind of like I always I call it a roadmap, and it doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't. You just have to have a, a, a like for fiction. What I tell people to do is just sit down and write the story as if you were telling it to children. You know the way you say, you know, first this happens, and then that happens, and then this, you know, and that terrible thing happens, and just write it out like that, um, and then separate each sentence, and each sentence then become it becomes your outline. Uh, but but it, you need to have a, something guiding you. Now, some people say they can just write out the way, but it actually will take you longer because you're going to write things that you may not end up using in, at the end. That's good advice, listeners that and viewers. That is really good advice. People can tell a story with enthusiasm and excitement. And even if you just record yourself telling yeah. that story. Then you can go back and flesh out an outline. That's great advice. Yep. Thank you. Okay, that's the first book. And then um, I was asked to write the second book, which is Revision Tips. And it's the same kind of book. It's just a, a, a collection of ways to make the revision process a lot faster and a lot easier. Um, and it's not just it's not editing. This is revision where you actually are going to go through and decide, do I need this scene? This should seem be in a different place. And it tells you how to do it without getting all confused and losing everything. Now, I have to admit that I come, my very first writing was done on a typewriter. And we actually had to physically cut and paste when we did revision. <laughs> so doing it with a computer is a lot easier, but the, you can still get lost and you can lose things and you can repeat things. And one of the little tricks I have is if you are cutting something, highlight it using the highlighter tool so you know that that's a piece that you're moving or changing or putting somewhere else. And you keep it highlighted so you know it's there and you don't repeat it or recopy it somewhere else. So that's a little trick. In fact, I love the highlighter tool for all kinds of things. If you need to uh, mark something to come back to, I just, I just highlight it. Because you can see it. It's right there. As you scan, you can make your your a novel or your your writing piece really small and just go scan right through it and see every place where you've 
need to do something because it's been highlighted. And then the third book is the research book because that's my love. And so I talk about ways to re do research, ways to know if what you're finding is accurate. Um, it's not enough to just take one document, to find one document and then believe that's the only story or the only piece of research. So you have to um, get more than one piece of data to put them together. And then I talk about how to store it, how to find it easily and quickly. And I talk a lot of, about um, plagiarism and copyrights and what you can and can't put in. So for example, you cannot use song lyrics in fiction, fictional works. Um, you can use the title of the song, but you cannot use the lyrics. And then the last book. So, so Joan, talking about that, and you do have to be real careful, you need to get permission. If you're gonna use lyrics. Um, what have you run into with the AI? I know now that when I upload the books that I publish to Amazon, uh, whether it's Kindle and now with the print books, they ask that question, was this book generated by, a, any part of this book generated by AI? Would you like to speak to that too, please? All right. Well, that's that's brand new. And it's something that authors have to be very conscious of. Um, I saw. Um, several uh, examples of things that you can put in the front of your book that that you know you state that it's that it has not been done using AI and that's always a good idea in fact I, I also have statements in the front of my biographical historical books explaining what what is actually you know what's true and what's fictional um, and that's in my research book I talk all about different things you can put. I don't have AI in there. I'm going to have to update it and put that in. Um, I should point out another thing about the historical fiction books is a lot of people say, well, how do I know what's true and what's not true in the in these books? So I believe in putting in a very detailed author's note in which you explain what parts are true and what parts you've fictionalized. Um, and I also put in sources. And I think anyone writing a biographical historical novel should include that because it is a question so many of my readers ask. So how do I know what's true and how do I know what you made up? And if you've done a good job, it's hard to tell. <laughs> right. And the, I'll just, I'll finish with my Write for Success series. The last book is my favorite book. It's called uh, Power Charge Your Language and it's about making your prose uh, the best it can be. And at the back, um, the ebook has a clickable index with uh, a problem you might have in your writing. And then you click on that and it'll take you to the section that tells you ways you could uh, improve the language. Well, that's a very helpful tip. Um... A lot of times, particularly on writing, um, how to write novels, fiction, nonfiction, um, an ebook can be very handy, maybe sometimes more so than a print book. Um, so do you do online workshops or blogs? Yes, I do a lot of blogs. I Under my joancoster.com, I have a blog that uh, features articles about women who should be remembered and so each month I have a, a woman that I feature um, and that always includes something they've written or said and quotes by them and pictures of them and so if you're interested in just learning about these amazing women um, I, one of my recent ones was the uh, woman who did the first race car driving um, uh, uh, Dorothy Levitt a amazing woman who got in a car and and raced and she took her dog with her <laughs> and the funny story about her was she she wore a long scarf um and oh, okay 
forgot the name of the woman who wore the long scarf and, and was killed because it got wrapped around the wheels. Oh, uh, well, I forgot her name. Oh, anyway, they were in competition with each other. But Dorothy Levin's scarf didn't get wrapped around the wheels of her car. So she was not as well remembered, even though she was the fastest, considered the fastest woman in the world at one time. That's amazing. <laughs> anyway, so that's my one blog. And then I have a writing blog, which is called Zara's Journal. And that that's, um, yes, it, it's under zarawest.me, M-E. And that one is all writing tips. So um, I have a, my one of my recent uh, blog posts is about thesauruses and using them and the two that I recommend that are online, uh, Moby Thesaurus and Word Hippo. So, which every writer in the world should know about. That's great. W would you like to tell us a little bit about your Zara West series? Okay. Um, my, uh, I have the first series is a, called The Skin Quartet, and it was published by Wild Rose Press. It's four books about, um, it's set in New York City in Williamsburg. All of the stories revolve around the Williamsburg Bridge. And it features tattoo artists and graffiti artists and the escapades that they get into. And those are romantic suspense or thrillers. Um, they are kind of dark, I would say, if people are interested in that. Um, and then my new series is called Tide Harbor Suspense. And these are set in Nova Scotia. Um, I spend a good part of the year in, I ha we have a, a home in Nova Scotia. We spend a good part of the year there. And so I've written about things that are related to the sea and boats and the environment. So the first book, which is um, out now, it's called uh, Concealed by the Tide. And it's about tidal turbines, which are um, machines they put on under the water and are moved by the tide to create electricity. And the Fundy Bay in Nova Scotia has the highest tides in the world. They're 50 foot tides. Wow. So yeah, so so if you go to the har harbor, all the boats will be sitting on the mud because when the tide goes out. It's, it's quite an interesting thing to see. So the first book is about tidal uh, turbines and uh, the environmental issues from both sides. Um, That's amazing. Um, we did have a viewer uh, chime in that the the woman who died with the long scarf was Isidore Duncan. She was a it. yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Joy, for your tip there. <laughs> right. Well, Joan, um, Joan has. Um, an excellent website. It's joancostner.com. Um, you can see her books, her blog, her workshops, and I've posted all those links in the Facebook comments. Um, Joan, do you do speaking engagements? I do. Um, I do Zooms. Okay. I'm, I don't, I don't do a lot of distance traveling okay. anymore. So you can get in touch with Joan on her website, correct? Yes. Um, if you'd like to talk with her about having her do a workshop with your book club, your class, your university class, your history class, <laughs> um, you've got a lot of different topics you can cover, plus writing skills. Um, I think that's wonderful. So Joan, what do you have coming up next? What do I have coming up next? Well, I'm going. I'm going to have the uh, next book, um, in the Tide Harbor Suspense coming out hopefully in another month. So that that's that's what I'm working on right now, and that's my goal. And then um, the Vinnie Ream book will be the next book that I bring out. So I have a lot of writing ahead of me, and a lot. I, I, Vinnie Ream is just about done. So that I don't think it'll take me too long to finish that up. And that's been a that's a fascinating story. That's Gilded Age. Um, I don't know if you know Mark Twain's book called The Gilded Age. Mm -hmm. Well, Vinnie Ream is one of the characters character caricatured in it.
Well, we will look forward to that. Congratulations on both those new books coming oh, thank out. Thank you. So, thank you. Joan, I want to thank you for coming on Zoom into Books. And I'd like to remind the viewers that the links are in the Facebook comments. This video will be available um, in the future on the Zoom into Books Facebook page. And in a few weeks, it will also be on the Zoom into Books YouTube channel. Um, if you haven't subscribed, please do. It's free. And if you have any further comments you'd like to uh, talk with Joan or communicate with her, please go to joancostner.com. Coster so, Joan, thank you so much and good luck with your future projects. It's been very nice to have you on Zoom into Books. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm.